Part three, the requisites for the existence of the university. In considering the idea of the university, we must consider certain realities which are simultaneously prerequisites and restrictions of that idea. First, there are the human beings who come together at the university, their attitudes and abilities, chapter eight. Second, there is the power of state and society whose will and needs sustain the university, chapter nine. Chapter eight, the human factor. All of university life depends upon the nature of the people participating in it. The character of a given university is determined by the professors appointed to it. Every university is dependent upon the kind of persons it can attract. The truest idea of the university is all in vain if the people who could realize it are no longer around. If these people exist, however, it becomes a question of life and death to the university to find and attract them. University life is no less dependent on students than on professors. The best professors flounder helplessly at a school where the student body is unfit. Hence, it is all up to the young people who are supposedly entitled to study. They must show themselves worthy of this privilege to the best of their ability. Admission to the university must be determined through some process of selection. For admission, some preparatory schooling is necessarily required. Without this, study at the university would be futile. Further, the person seeking admission must be educable. That is, he must have the capacities, talents, and characteristics which can be developed through study at a university. There is the question as to the kind of student to which the university addresses itself, outwardly to all, intrinsically to the best only. Its aim is that the best in the growing generation may be able to develop freely. Yet who will turn out to be the best cannot be determined beforehand. It is difficult, moreover, deliberately to produce or sponsor a specific type without perhaps slighting the most capable, that is, the most serious groups of students, those who are most deeply involved with truth as an ideal. For such people, study and research are not mere drudgery or simply one occupation among many others. Rather, the privilege of helping to create new knowledge, and serve the cause of truth is to them a matter of the most vital and personal concern. Thus, the best cannot be defined in terms of a single type. They represent a great variety of individuals who have identified their life and innermost being with the objective achievement of truths and results. The intellectually oriented person is typically committed to the intellectual life, not as a means to something else, some external purpose or worldly success, but for its own sake. Thus he strives within his particular professional situation to realize and perfect a given professional ideal, such as doctor, teacher, judge, etc., to infuse each sphere of life with its requisite measure of human integrity and each phase of intellectual work with the clear awareness of its underlying meaning. When relieved from concern with the immediate exigencies of life, such a man will utilize his leisure in the disciplined pursuit of problems of intrinsic value. If his very life Life is an end in itself, it is so only because it coincides with the fulfillment of an objective intellectual task, the awareness of which imparts a deep sense of human satisfaction. Manifestly, the best are selected not so that they can be used as human raw material for ends unrelated to their own human fulfillment, but so that their very intellectuality may help them achieve their proper individual humanity as an end in itself. The problem of selecting individuals from among a great variety of human types falls under three heads. One, what aptitudes are desirable? Two, how are they distributed? And three, who is to make the selection? Types of aptitude. In our experience, people are both very different and very much alike. Whoever demands equal rights for all is thinking of what men have in common. This demand is valid where common ground and equality really exist, as in material existence and its needs. To stress the differences between men means to demand that qualitative difference between men be recognized and respected. To this group belongs those who recognize the various aptitudes and desire their most effective employment, who take note of human interests and drives of the different degrees of commitment to the life of the mind and the ability to sacrifice on behalf of this life. The differences among people are truly extraordinary. For anyone prepared to face facts, this is an inescapable insight. Practical experience and tests confirm it. At the same time, man is intrinsically a being with unlimited possibilities open to him. For strictly speaking, the individual as a whole can never be classified according to a given talent or character type. All such attempts illumine only aspects of him never the whole. Three distinctions may conveniently be made. There are a. The variables of aptitude. 
memory, the ability to observe and learn, resistance to fatigue, amenability to training, sensory equipment, ability to distinguish differences, the power of concentration speed, etc. All this is experimentally verifiable and more or less testable. Whole groups of individuals can be graded so as to select those best fitted for certain aptitudes. B. Intelligence proper is harder to get at. Various techniques have been tried to test ability to see relationships, adaptability, and judgment, but their results are far less reliable. Though clearly reliable at times, they can surprise us with apparent evidence to the fact that other Otherwise, unpromising people seem to show considerable intelligence in one specific area. These, there is an ambiguity of emphasis on special talent on the one hand and general intelligence on the other without a final decision in favor of one or the other. Then there are C, spirituality and the ethos of intellectual commitment those factors which can neither be experimentally grasped nor studied empirically with any degree of finality. They are intelligence in the sense of personal commitment, motivation, apart from the pleasure involved in performance, in succeeding, and in outperforming others, devotion to one's work, nobility of mind, truthfulness, and enthusiasm for learning. These qualities are always rare even among the examiners who make the actual selection and who frequently are themselves only poorly endowed with the spark of intellect so defined. D. Creativity is wholly inaccessible to objective testing. It is given to some and may either be developed through hard work or wasted through disregard. There are numbers of depraved geniuses who waste their gifts through lack of discipline and good sense. Genius develops only where it is matched by commensurate commitment, willpower, application, and craftsmanship. There are highly gifted people who eventually lose everything and degenerate intellectually. So long as the flame of genius is tended, it produces basic insights ideas and forms. It cannot be produced at will, calculated, bred, deliberately favored in selection, or enforced in terms of standards. Unlike talent and aptitude, it cannot be inherited. Metaphysically speaking, genius is an experiment, a conjecture of absolute mind. It is the source of all intellectual change. We live in the insights obtained for us by genius and made available to everyday understanding. Our highest respect is due to genius even where it is wasted. It is up to us to perceive real genius to bring it to light, to make it felt. Here is a task we can deliberately undertake, to assimilate the work of genius. However great the difference between genius and ourselves, there is an impulse of genius and basic insight in every person, especially in youth. We are concerned with it because somewhere, we too, are of its kind. There is an absolute difference between genius and everything else, which is only talent and goodwill. Still, nobody is entirely a genius, only a human being with genius. This fire burns more or less brightly in all people. No man is a god. But the difference in degree is so tremendous that we have a qualitative basis for feeling our distance from genius. The decisive difference between people is whether this demon rules their lives or whether they are primarily governed by a social, occupational, and ethical order alone. In distinguishing aptitudes, intelligence, spirituality, and creativity, we are prone to the fallacy of misplaced concreteness by thinking that ability is something definitely given. In the first place, the character traits that appear in terms of aptitude cannot be grasped the way we grasp simple concrete objects, for they are the human factor par excellence, which is only partially accessible to objective psychological techniques. To a very large extent, character and aptitude remain accessible only to the philosopher willing to face the transcendental, encompassing aspect of man. Psychological aptitude tests are not meaningful beyond the level of purely external characteristics. There simply are no objective criteria by which the encompassing can be measured and tested. In the second place, no person is ever entirely in agreement with what his outward appearance indicates. Just as an entire people may appear changed if the traditional ruling group is dis displaced by a new human type of hitherto obscure and subservient standing, so an individual can become an entirely different person when a new environment of language and gesture follows hitherto unfamiliar elements of his personality. Any particular realization of human possibilities is no more than fragmentary by comparison with a man's full potential. It is a highly selective rearrangement favoring a few specific possibilities. In the third place, man is the source of his own decisions. At some point, every man makes a decision concerning himself. The phrase, but I made that way, is only a device of evading one's freedom. There nevertheless exists a broad inventory of human qualities which cannot be changed and must simply be accepted, but one cannot be careful enough when pronouncing certain character traits final or postulating that certain talents are biologically inherited. I do not doubt that these exist and exert a profound 
effect in terms of offering certain possibilities or excluding them. But we have not succeeded in identifying these traits precisely, except where they fall within the limits of conventional testing procedures. One judges people altogether too easily. The scientific study of character and ability is a matter of serious and lofty interest, but in the last analysis, we know clearly that we do not know. This is precisely why we must leave room for education and the demands man makes upon himself. Education affects those people most significantly who have not made up their minds about themselves. How we are brought up from earliest youth is all important. Not only a person's fixed, testable aptitude is decisive, but also unforeseeable possibilities whose realization always destroys other possibilities. The dominant spirit of a home an institution, a community, can be recognized through the behavior and way of speaking which the group adopts, through symbols and phrases unconsciously acknowledged, through group standards and conventions. To judge a group of people by their appearances is always unfair if one does not take into account the education which has been and continues to be part of their daily lives. To learn more about their true potentials, though never all, one would have to see what would have become of them under a different upbringing. The whole courage to educate derives from a trust in such dormant potentialities. Though no man can ever know once and for all who he is and what he can do. He must try himself out. Serious personal commitment, verifiable only by one's conscience and not to be relegated to the pressure of outside opinion, must be one's sole guide. I cannot know beforehand what I can make of myself through hard work and resolute commitment. Fichte actually advises against self-examination of one's abilities. Those able to enter a university should think of themselves as scholars to be, since one must always strive to live up to the standards implicit in a given situation. At the university, one must consider oneself called upon to do the very best one can as a matter not of privilege but of obligation. All told, people are not fixed species which can be made use of like animals. They constantly change and develop because they are full of hidden possibilities. Aptitudes and the Characteristics of the Masses All societies contain differences not only in material welfare but, above all and unavoidably, in rank. Ideally, the best are also the leaders so that the social hierarchy coincides with the hierarchy of personal excellence and aptitude. This was Plato's ideal. Social conditions would not improve until philosophers were statesmen, or statesmen philosophers. This ideal cannot be completely realized, for everything human is in flux, and no realization can last for more than a moment. There are two reasons for this. Opinions change as to which personal values are the most important ones. Various talents become more or less useful according to the sociological, economic, and technical world situation. Moreover, every difference of competence is quickly frozen into formal status, for without permanence and continuity, life could not go on. It does not matter greatly if this status is inherited or passed on from teacher to pupil. Those that follow after the original group of creative leaders tend to become epigons, possessing rather than creating tradition and losing the original spirit. Thus the ideal itself is exposed to corruption. It must therefore rely on the ablest of any generation to fill the leading positions. Sociological differences themselves demand that such a selection takes place. Whether it occurs spontaneously or deliberately, it is unavoidable in any case. Many are the forces that affect this selection. The goal of fair distribution of education opportunity is achieved only in limited areas of selection. The ideal that every man gets his due, learn, and work according to his natural capacities is attained not even by the greatest and happiest of man. Ideally, man is infinite, though harnessed in finite conditions. He is human only to the extent that he acknowledges these conditions. It is up to each man to accept his limitations and to achieve freedom within them. Limitation is a matter of inheritance and ability. Man lives in a time scheme and cannot do everything at once. He is as limited as his life. His native equipment imposes insurmountable limitations. Nonetheless, he is aware that he is free. Restriction is a matter also of background and sociological circumstances. Yet these very restrictions open up new opportunities. Here, too, the person of caliber will refuse to give up the last vestiges of freedom. As he struggles to realize himself, each man insists on this freedom in the face of limitation 
and coercion everywhere. When I gather certain facts in order to promote the best possible selection of persons to receive higher education, I break down some of these sociological barriers. Facts in this sense, for example, are the sociological background of intellectual leaders in a given historical period. Thus, one can inquire into the social origin of outstanding men. A famous German from 1700 to 1860, whose biographical sketch takes up two or more pages in the general German biography, 83.2% came from the upper classes, while 16.8% came from the lower classes, their families being manual workers, farmers, or proletarians. Of those who belonged to the lower classes, 32.7% became artists, 27.8% academicians, 14.6% ministers. The remaining professions are represented by very small percentages. Throughout those centuries, the margin by which the lower classes outnumbered the upper classes was tremendous. German culture was sustained by a few tens of thousands of people as distinct from the remaining millions. It does not, however, follow that the upper classes are more talented by nature. All one may conclude is that the upper classes enjoy a more favorable balance of those educational opportunities, which are the condition of supreme achievement. Conversely, however, it would be rash to assume that aptitudes are equally distributed among all social classes, the only differences being those of opportunity. If biological qualities can be modified by selective breeding, then innate differences of ability between sociological classes with a long, unbroken tradition are entirely conceivable. Intrinsically, man is not simply born. It is not a matter of indifference into what family group or class one is born. His human substance is a product of native endowments and history. Children from families who for generations have kept alive a cultural tradition are intrinsically different from other children. The neglects of children can never be made up. Thus, people who in their youth have come in contact with the nobility of Hellenic culture will retain a spark of its vitality for the rest of their lives. They will retain a a sense of graceful elegance, a feeling for quality, and a perception of spiritual greatness, which otherwise they might never have had. Even the greatest intellectual creations are in some way dependent on the individual's experience as a child. There is something plebeian about Fichte, despite the high flight of his genius, and there is for that genius a streak of fanaticism and narrow-mindedness the counterpart of social servility. Tradition alone must not be the only or even foremost criterion for selection, but truthfulness and justice require that the value of tradition in shaping the individual be recognized. In our time, irreplaceable treasures of tradition were thoughtlessly squandered. One could hear such misleading opinions as, the past was all glory and doom. Today, we are concerned with something which all understand and take part in. All true and good. Obviously, a given tradition cannot be presupposed in the case of a person who has no tradition in his background and yet must be brought to self-realization. It is he who will have to be brought to the tradition, even though as an adult, he will assimilate it differently than he would have done as a child. Even at its best, general education cannot by itself convey man's primary thirst for knowledge. Protracted study, the training of generations, the tradition of a cultivated family, all enter into the process of personal growth. Yet neither schooling, even if available to all, nor the kind of material comfort which allows a lucky few to try a number of things, one after another, are decisive by themselves. What matters most is informed firmness of purpose and self-discipline. Membership in a family of such traditions is no automatic asset. It can be made an asset if paired with a corresponding sense of obligation. Privileged social status is no automatic asset either. During the past 50 years, materialism, the craze to own everything, proud of its price but with no respect for its intrinsic value, has been far more in evidence in the upper classes. Gone is the traditional background of so many outstanding men, the Protestant parish house, nobility, and the patrician upbringing. There is no artificial substitute for them. Another fact comparable to the sociological factor just mentioned is the quality of the average person, the great mass of people, elusive as the quality may be. All selection is from this mass, and taken as a whole, even a ruling class is such a mass. By an amazing consensus of history, the qualities of any mass have been held in universal low esteem. Most people tend to think of themselves as endowed with more than ordinary gifts, and only in times of trouble avail themselves of the excuse that they have no ability in a given direction. As regards intellectual matters, most people vacillate between arrogance and lame excuses. They strive to seem stronger than they really are. Thus, they naively seek to remake the world from the ground up, uncritically expecting the world as a whole to turn just harmonious and happy. 
Instead of supervising their own growth with the strictest self-discipline and doing their duty, they run away from both in obedience to something they call an idea and indulge in the profoundly unintelligent raising of uncritical demands. Solidarity of interests exists not only within a given class, but also and instinctively among those of average ability. The mass is hostile to excellence. The mass, recognizing its own incompetence, may raise up and exalt a leader so as to effect a general leveling and just as easily betray him again. Instinctively, the average man maintains that political equality extends to intellect and ability. To be sure, there are people who acknowledge their own shortcomings and who act accordingly. But precisely this is an indication of greater stature. A person with strong intellectual motivation may be hampered by his imperfect initial equipment, but if he has genuine enthusiasm and willingness to sacrifice, he must be allowed to follow his calling. The Process of Selection The factors which, apart from any deliberate screening, inherently and indirectly govern the selection of candidates for university study are extremely complex. Formerly, free competition supposedly favoring the survival of the fittest was held to be the best form of selection because it is the most natural. What was overlooked is that any given contest is decided not so much by intellectual ability and interest as by special aptitudes. Thus, when examinations are the sole criterion, success becomes a matter of willpower and the ability to master the required body of facts. Thus, among adults who in their own spare time have successfully prepared for university entrance and have gone on to to doctoral and postdoctoral work, there are also those who have never risen above mechanical memorization and who, despite encyclopedic knowledge, have never felt the breath of genuine intellectuality. Having gone out for success alone, they have converted their entire personality into a tool toward that end. Moreover, selection may indirectly depend on one's willingness to assimilate the Weltenschwang, or worldview of a group, membership in which confers status. To achieve status in such a group, the individual has to conform both inwardly and outwardly. It soon becomes impossible to disassociate oneself from the role one is playing. Those who most scrupulously conform to the approved pattern make the best careers. Here, too, specific aptitudes rather than real intelligence are the decisive factor. Such a willingness to be regimented, to make concessions, to show aggressiveness or contradictory indecision. Depending upon the group, one is trying to please. Both processes of indirect selection illustrate the effects of the presence or absence of rewards set by society on intellectual achievements. So long as intellectual life brings no tangible rewards, social or economic, only those fired by an uncompromising determination will turn to it. To the extent, however, that education and scholarship carry privilege, they become popular with the mass of people. Since most people seek whatever promises privilege and prestige in excess of their actual capacities, social and economic premiums do not actually favor intellectual achievement, but only its external trappings. The human type preferred by the mechanism of rewards is one without interest in anything for its own sake, in leisure and contemplation, but only in the sterile alternation of working hard and playing hard. To such people, everything is but a step up and means to an end, to acquire the social and economic rewards of success with an appetite which increases endlessly. The realization that such are the mechanisms of selection can make anyone a pessimist. Yet the thought of mere accident of birth demands that we succeed in selecting and attracting the right kind of person for university study. All too quickly we assume that that selection must be according to ability, and that such ability must and can be objectively determined in each individual case, and that selection shall be direct and deliberate rather than indirect and accidental. In any case, the truly great individuals cannot be selected and identified in advance through tests. We have to accept the fact that although ordinary talent is measurable, uncommon talent is difficult to measure and genius not at all. That's a quote by Grimm. For the sake of the truly great, living as they do counter to their times and environment, there ought to remain enough elasticity in our institutions to allow for the unpredictable and the risks of radical innovation. Total organization and an inflexible selection machinery would entail standardized performance for set goals and soon lead to paralysis. The life of the mind would vanish. The institution would become the absolute and final arbiter of everything. 
The great men, however, who see the severity of life more than others, since they must constantly fight for the, an existence that fits no pre-existent patterns and traditionally makes them the victims of witch hunts, are the exception. Selection as a technique of approximation indispensable for sociological reasons remains a meaningful problem. Even when we must not forget that every selection is in some way an injustice, we delude ourselves when we think that we can avoid such injustice through rational and determined effort. In correcting the injustice done to one party, we unavoidably cause new injustices to other parties. Since it is impossible to reach a final solution in this problem of selection, we must deliberately retain a sense of the infinite potentialities of human nature. Those whose judgment and decision are responsible for the selection must so exercise their responsibility that they neither obstruct the few with outstanding talent nor favor the mediocre and inferior, the ambitious and demanding, or the false and pretentious. Direct selection can be effected in any of three ways. One, through examinations. Two, through personal selection by someone of higher rank than the applicant. Three, through election from below by a specified group of people. As for examinations, they are either entrance tests to determine if a person is qualified to study, or they are final examinations to certify that a person has completed a course of study. Supposing that from a large group of people a mere handful is to be selected for study at a higher school or university, some people will be fascinated by the idea the psychological experiments can objectively determine who the best are. A technique of determining aptitude in advance of actual training, of predicting a person's true potential, would certainly be extremely important. Yet what can we actually test? First and foremost, potential intelligence. Actual intelligence only within certain limits, nothing more. Potential achievement and available tools, but not quality of mind, creativity, willpower, and selflessness. If ever a selection machine were to be built whose purpose was to determine an individual's entire future, we should have reached the polar opposite of freedom and free will, which are indispensable to the life of the mind. Man would be trapped in a situation quite as deterministic in its own way as heredity itself, except that it would be far harder to put up with depending, as it does, not on a mysterious destiny, but on human beings who very likely are not even properly qualified qualified for their job. Testing, as a technique supplementing the personal judgment of men of experience, is mandatory only if a particular profession requires the type of aptitude that can be tested. Early selection for admission to higher education is unavoidable since today such education can be made available only to a fraction of the whole population. To demand higher education for all persons of ability is to give educational opportunity to the able among the whole population, not just among a few social strata. It also means refusing to obstruct genuine ability by over-specialized testing procedures. Any entrance requirement is bound to build up inhibitions on the part of potential applicants, particularly if the intellectual values involved are hard to grasp anyway. It is more than likely that there are aptitudes which cannot be tested, that the life of the mind thrives on slack and the ability to move about freely, and that the more rigidly an institution is controlled, the greater are its anti-intellectual tendencies. Final examinations, too, like entrance examinations, can be used for one of two different aims. Either they certify the attainment of normal proficiency in a given field, all but the incompetent being allowed to make up exams in case of failure, or they can be used to screen out all but the top students possibly even a previously fixed number. As for selection by ranking individuals, this is difficult to institutionalize since only few people have the necessary qualifications. Cases in point are the monarch who elects his advisors, the teacher who selects his assistants, the university administrator who in his professional capacity must discover those best suited for appointment. Actually, personal selection is the surest and justest way because it reaches those deep-lying qualities which escape all measurement. This is true, however, only in those rare cases where the person in charge of the selection has an inherent desire to serve and give himself freely and objectively to the task of deciding about human worth and aptitude without allowing private prejudice to offset his judgment. In most cases, however, alien motivations are allowed to displace this judgment at once most personal and most objective. When corporate choice replaces individual choice, there is a tendency toward the mediocre. There have never been more than a gifted few who, 
having an eye for the true substance in man, were truly qualified to choose. As a rule, professors tend to favor their own students and disciples. They instinctively tend to sidetrack talents and intellects superior to their own. Conversely, there are a few professors who, from their very awareness of this danger, fight their own preferences and sympathies to the point of lapsing into a kind of partiality in reverse and appoint those who they do not really want at all. Here again, the selection will be poor, even incomprehensible. Finally, and this is probably the most common situation today, the question of need becomes the dominant motive of selection. Human beings are evaluated only as means to an end. The personal stamp which inevitably characterizes intellectual existence is pushed aside as immaterial, yet not in favor of some higher matter, but simply in favor of certain tangible external criteria of fitness to fill a specific need. Sometimes, by sheer luck, the indefinable art of selecting the right people is actually practiced. This may occur in a hospital where an atmosphere of mutual trust prevails between the director, on the one hand, and the chief physician and his staff, on the other. In situations such as these, organizations develop a characteristic spirit of their own. The tactless and incompetent are quietly dropped. The rest are given elbow room. Decency and dependability set the tone. Thus, by a combination of good luck and individual authority, an area has been created where intellectual work of importance can freely be accomplished. It is easier to achieve this within the framework of a clinic than an entire university, within a select group of one's own students than within an entire faculty. Whoever is in a position where he must personally select candidates must first of all familiarize himself with the candidate's published work so as to evaluate its true significance. Secondly, he must evaluate the candidate in personal discussion with him. This is easy where both candidate and examiner think along similar lines, but it becomes difficult and ceases to carry conviction where the candidate's cast of mind seems strange and there is as yet no common ground of work and shared enthusiasm. It may be possible to listen from afar through perceptive reason and thus to decide if the candidate has something valuable to contribute. In any case, the examiner must be open-minded and not lazily confine himself to familiar standards. Next to objective intellectual attainment, he would do well to consider every indication of the personality of the candidate, from physical appearance to handwriting. Thirdly, there is the possibility of selecting new appointees by majority vote. Either the students elect their own teachers, or the teachers themselves elect new faculty members by co-option. While corporate bodies must resort to co-option, there is no such need for this election of professors by a vote on the part of the students. Nothing good can come from a situation where the judges will be elected by the very persons over whom they will sit in examination. It would always work out in favor of the easiest men. Next, students would subconsciously let their judgment be swayed by such external characteristics, or lack thereof, of sex appeal, didactic ability, stage presence. The great mass of people always fall for the best showmen. There is, to be sure, a minority of perceptive young people with an unerring eye for the teacher's competence command of the material, stimulating powers, and even intellectual rank. Instinctively, they recognize what is genuine. Yet only rarely will young people of their kind command the majority necessary in elections. Clearly then, all three techniques for selection, examination, personal selection, and election by majority vote, have their shortcomings. They are unavoidable as they are unreliable. They will have to be stripped of their aura of absolute finality in order to leave room for the unusual person. Examinations will, of course, remain indispensable as certifications of competence. Yet the university is interested in examinations only to the extent that they increase the educational opportunities open to intellectually active people. This interest is only indirectly served by improving the quality of examinations. By ceaselessly improving examinations and making them more meaningful intellectually, we can improve imperceptibly the institutional procedures of selection. Only the average student benefits from a long series of examinations pacing his course of study. Independent minds will always prefer a single examination at the end of a long period of free study. Their cause is benefited if the university requires all its students to be independent and self-reliant. Only these students are mature. They need no master because they have taken themselves in hand. They expose themselves to doctrines, viewpoints, surveys, facts, good counsel, only in order to examine and decide for themselves. The university is not the place to look for step-by-step -step guidance. Real students have initiative. They can set their own problems. They can work intellectually and know the meaning of work. 
They are individuals who deepen their individuality through communication. They are not the people as a whole, nor the average, not the mass, but numerous individuals who risk being themselves. This is at once reality and necessary fiction. It represents an unattainable ideal and at the same time a challenge to live up to one's highest aspirations. University study is terminated by the single examination. Its nature is supremely important. Basically, it is only meant to confirm what has already taken place. Self-reflection on the part of the students through the exercise of their freedom. The university would cease being a university if a properly qualified student body were shepherded through a fixed curriculum subject to periodic control by examinations. The very nature of the university demands instead that the individual exercise his own choices throughout his entire course of study at the acknowledged risk of ending up with nothing. Hence, our most serious and ultimately insoluble problem is how to create an intellectual and institutional climate at the university favorable to such independence. First and foremost, there is the task of improving the final examinations. They must be simplified and broadened at the same time. Simplified by limiting the fields covered and by reducing their number. Broadened by calling upon the entire intellectual energy, judgment, and ability of the candidate. The examinations must proceed from a real assessment of the student's conduct and achievement in seminars and other forms of group work. Mere evidence of industry and grades are unimportant. There must be tangible proof of achievement. Good written work ought to also be submitted and should also be taken into account. In the examination itself, attention must be paid not only to factual knowledge, but to the candidate's conduct, his approach to a given problem, the type of methods he uses, his ability to see things, his ability to write and speak in a manner appropriate to the subject's matter at hand. Requirements may change in accordance with the number of applicants and the demands of certain professions. If a high general level of achievement is reached, the standards of selection are bound to be correspondingly high. In every case, the candidate must remain aware that he may, after all, fail to pass in the end. As to their subject, the examinations ought to be largely dependent upon the candidate's own choice. The fiction of encyclopedic knowledge must be abandoned. Care must be taken that the examiner's teaching habits do not subject the candidate's freedom of study to their own pet schemes making success in the examination dependent upon familiarity with the specific lectures and seminars given by the examiners. Through mutual exchange of experiences and viewpoints, universities must consciously develop and improve their examining techniques. Even though the examiner's skill counts for most, systematic improvement is possible. The psychology and philosophy of education must keep us in touch with the qualities both of talent and training necessary for the learned professions. Finally, examinations and grades must be given as rarely as possible. The more numerous they become, the less responsibly they can be administered. If they are few in number, they can be administered with seriousness and with thoroughness. The busy routine of tests and marks combined with excessive factual coverage comes to nothing because this kind of examination has ceased to be truly selective. Despite their routine character, they place an undue burden on the professor's time and lower the general level of the intellectual life. Thank you for listening to this audio recording by David McCarricker, published by Theory Underground. This work has been placed in the public domain because of its importance. I hope that you all enjoy this during your holidays in its small daily doses, like an advent calendar. And that if you are intrigued to hear lectures on the topic of the idea of the university, then I hope you will consider joining the course that I am leading with Brian Weeks and Ann Snellgrove, the three of us, all educators, interested in the idea of higher education and a kind of learning environment that cares about the freedom of individuals to be able to research what they find most interesting as opposed to what big business or political partisans think you ought to be researching. I'm going to actually show you all really quick what the website looks like. So you go to theory-underground.com. Make sure to register with the website and then go to courses right here. You can also go to events and get to it that way. And then right here you see Mikey teaches Zizek for they know not what they do. That's a class that kicks off in February. We also have professional managerial class consciousness that's kicking off at the end of January. And I'm teaching that one with Elton. And then the idea of the university right here. 
All three of these are courses that you can add to your shopping cart and choose to take if you want. But the idea of the university, if you click on it, if you're not already logged in, then this is what you should see. Click take this course, click add to cart, view cart, and then proceed to checkout. Oh, one quick thing, don't forget, I guarantee the verification email will be sent to your spam folder. So if you're going, I tried to sign up with their website, I registered and everything, I just didn't never get the, I never got the email, uh, don't worry. It's in your spam folder. You just have to find it, and you might not be able to find it from your phone. You might have to actually sit down at a laptop. I'm sorry, it's not always as easy as giant mega corporations make it when you try to do stuff underground. So go for it, try it out. Let me know if it works. Okay, bye. So anyway, that's how you do it. I hope to see you there in the discussions on the Zoom chat, but also in the forums where the real conversation will hopefully be taking place on the website. Anyway, everyone, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Take care.